We'll go through their readings and then we're going to go over and unveil the beautiful plaque that is on the wall behind me and that poem will be read. So someone who needs no introduction, come on up please, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. I'm, I'm just so excited to be here. My mouth is dry, you know what I mean? So, um, you all have a list of the sequence of readers. And so what I would like to do is to have the sequence of readers just continue on without applause in between just to keep the ambience of the poetry flowing. And so as soon as you see the person that's before you, prepare to come up to the microphone. I am going to take the microphone to uh, Roberta, uh, which would make it easier for her to, to read, because she's quite a distance from the mic, so I'll be doing that. But yeah, Cleo asked me if I'd read it, and I said, well, couldn't you just stand here? Look at she's all sparkly for the event. I love that. OK, this is called The Way of Winter, a Villanelle by Cleo Griffith. The way that winter enters can be mischievous or kind. She follows autumn's colors but does not duplicate. Who knows which way she'll announce herself? Who knows what's on her mind? She does not enter heedlessly. She's neither deaf nor blind. But temperamental she may be as to what will motivate the way the winter enters be she mischievous or kind. Perhaps in autumn's careless wake a bird got left behind and shivers so kind winter warms she does commiserate. Who knows which way she'll announce herself? Who knows what's on her mind? When she, spr when the, when she springs hard upon the trees and threatens every spine, and strips the leaves as though she is angered, sore, irate. The way that winter enters can be mischievous or kind. Sometimes it seems she must express herself, herself unwind, with mellow days, then slowly chill her will to validate. She knows which way she's announced herself, knows what's next in mind. It may be rain, it may be clouds, whatever she may find, to play in, in her time aloud before she must vacate. The way the winter exits can be mischievous or kind. Who knows which way she'll leave our sphere? Who knows what's on her mind? This poem is titled, Whose Body? Sitting on a wooden bench in a park near a river, the sun took my place. There was a core of effortless concentration, free of idea and form and purpose, and a flowing out all around radiance that seemed to waver sweetly between light and particle. I realized the river could also take my body's place and the white goose who lost its mate, and the oak tree, trees with their bright green spring growth. Perhaps these are closer to my true form. Perhaps these are the body I was really given. And this head and torso, these limbs, I think as mine, yet can only partially see, belong more to the sun, the river, the goose, and the trees in their spring. This is called A Snail's Place. It's noon and already hot. I leap for the morning newspaper and just miss flattening a snail the size of a cufflink on the edge of the walkway. He might be meditating or making plans for the day because he does not seem to reckon my big foot about to crush his world. I pick him up and he rolls on my palm like a marble before his tentacles appear where his black eyes sit. He can't live long in the sun. He has a heart and lungs and in the heat he will tighten up in his shell and try to endure. 
He might wish for a cloud overhead to cool the air or an explosion from the lawn sprinklers. I take him into my kitchen and set him on a dish with a little water spread around. Hours later, I see he has deserted the dish and traveled upside down to sleep under the table. Where did he learn such patience, this trick of balance? Outside in the cool evening, I put him under a bush in the garden. He paddles his feet that are like the ribboned edge of a christening gown and crawls into the soft dirt. He will find a place under a rock and come out at midnight for a nip of leaf or a taste of rosebud. He will look for friends, too, because nails are, snails are social. Good luck, snail, I say. Stay clear of poisons and heavy-footed humans. His kind has lived 500 million years on Earth, so if the harsh world doesn't find him with its rage and cruelty, he could live at least 25 years in my backyard. No, he's not beautiful, he doesn't shine, he's slow, and for some, a pest. But he has survived so long unchanging, and that must count for something. Home. There is so much we will forget, and most of it doesn't matter. The grocery lists and the Tuesdays. But we can't forget that first our valley was grassland, was riparian woodlands, was marsh, was peopled by those who knew the places where the fish gathered, who knew the seasons of oaks, who knew the stories the stars told. We cannot forget the way the wind, given its unimpeded way, ripples the needle grass and the waters, moves them in the same rhythms. And let's not forget the calls of the cranes filling the air with a sound so dense there's almost no room for breath. And we must remember, too, what's already lost, the grisly, so much of the quiet marshlands. Our world is poorer without them. But the rivers still converge, and the beavers build their dams, and the hawks, ferruginous and red-tailed, drift on the thermals, and all of this was happening, was here before we were, before our grocery lists and our Tuesdays. So we can't forget the vernal pools with their sudden flowers and their patient species buried and waiting, earthbound constellations of life mirroring the constellations that shine above us with stories we can't forget, just as we can't forget that an earthquake in far-off ocean makes waves that flow, that propagate to our nearer shores, that the moon's gravity tugs at our wild oceans, that our galaxy has wrapped its spiraling arms around our sun, that our sun is just one bright star in a universe filled with bright stars, the space between them expanding faster than we'd even imagined. And we can't forget, even as we're learning, even as we're amazed at finding ourselves here in this universe, in this galaxy, on this planet, in this broad valley, with these creatures, in this place with its pockets of grassland and woods, which we won't forget, which we will care for, because this is where we live, one of many species. This is our shared and wondrous home. I wrote this poem about a trip that Lynn and Lillian Valley took to a reading at the Crocker Museum in, in 2013. Reading at the Crocker, July 2013. Our conversation began en route about GMO corn planted in egret territory, a dietary dilemma. I remembered that hawk yesterday, the one who grazed across my car's hood in the middle of town. It wore the black and gray and brown I am wearing today. We arrived in city of Sacrament, got caught in the pewter maze of a parking garage restricted to employees and their visitors. We dined with Grackle and Hummingbird, strolled to city park, sat at picnic tables, under mulberry mother tree. A murder, no, a mass murder of crows filled the spaces of light between branches at twilight next to the new Crocker Museum. 
where a crowd, what is a word for a group of them, of poets, had gathered to hear from some of their own. Night sounds rang in the gloaming, voices clear and then mute, crows hunkered in the shadows. This poem is Summer Monsoon for Rene. He watches wisps of clouds jostling one another like runners in a marathon. Anvil-shaped thunderheads hammer gray soot sky into darkness. Lightning bolts splinter the horizon, burning down the summer. Five-second pause, rifle crack thunders overhead. Low rolling rumble follows. Storm crawls down Cave Creek Canyon. Squall descends, wind gusts bend wild grasses and mesquites. Rain with thick fingers drums the roof, a rake dragging over gravel. Fat drops race down windows, splatter on the brick courtyard, a cow peeing sideways on a flat rock. He knows in the distance the racing water will empty into grateful laps of yucca, agave, and choya. He knows the sun will return, find its rightful place in a sapphire blue sky, and perfectly round raindrops, tiny prisms, will balance precariously on prickly pears' sharp thorns until they quiver ever so slightly and fall. One by one, he counts them. Uh, so I started writing this poem last night, or, and so it doesn't have a, a title yet. Under canopy of two billows, oblivious to four Canada geese who just arrived, a mallard, a mallard bobs his head in unison with his mate. Their choreography, silent and precise, they paddle in companionable circles around the shallow green water. They grace the hour with their courtly ballet, tender, enviable is their connection. By the ivy at water's edge, a black-crowned night heron waits, hunched over, its stiletto poised, its stiletto big poised for the kill, its, its eyes opaque with intent. Yesterday, the heron devoured one of the ducklings. It stretches its neck, runs its beak down, its, down chest feathers, resumes the watch, its day is measureless. Near dusk, I take a bag of garbage out to the bin, see the bright neon lights on Coffee Road, hear the plain of song of geese overhead, look to the thin blue sky, catch the four geese from this afternoon, tacking west at full sail. This is titled, Rivers. All my life, I have loved rivers. In my teens, the American river ran clear and cold, fool's gold glistening under my dolphin body. I swam against the current, navigating the miniature rapids where sweet liquid flowed through baked earth dotted by pale oaks. Smooth boulders littered the river where I sunbathed with other teens, my hair drying golden, my body lean with youth and almost constant motion. I swam the Merced too, a kaleidoscope of summers with our sons and in time our granddaughters. I lay on my back, pulling, tugging against the current, drinking in the elements of forest, cliffs, sky, here I shed the gravity that hobbles my walking self. I feel lithe again, in spite of new layers I have gathered with age. I am in something, part of something, for which I have no words. All my life I have loved rivers. The poem is called Mistaken Identity. My violin hung from its wall hook, beckoned to be played, 2002 pandemic a year postponed practice melodies. On the shelf below were miscellaneous tools of the trade, a cloth to clean surfaces, strings, a box of resin, 
uh, and knickknacks to enhance the shelf's look. It had been months since this violin had a voice. Today it would be lifted from its hook. Today was its day to sing. Amber rosin is used to create a tacky surface between violin and bow. The horsehair stretches end to end, grabs the strings, then releases, creating a sound. It is a marriage between bow and violin. I took the amber block from the shelf. Tightened the bow's hairs and began plying rosin to the bow. Carefully, I guided the bow across the violin. No sound. Again, the bow was drawn across the strings, even tighter, heavier pressure. No sound. On that shelf sat an old-time block of soap. <laughs> the same size and the same look as, ra as rosin. <laughs> now what? <laughs> Summer backyard. Praying mantis resides on tall sunflowers. She's wide, with red, flexible legs. Her antennae smell air messages. She pulls her body to a neighboring stem and dangles in air like a trapeze artist who sways in between passes. Mantis hisses from her guts. Her eyes follow the circling foray of crows and sparrows who shadow blue fire sky. Mantis forged ancient landscapes. Her green diamond face turns away from time. Has she ever prayed to prophets? Or has she always been a stealth warrior? Outdoor education. For three days we walked between trees past moss in various shades of green, spikes, and fans, and forests on granite. Small creatures played. We saw many deer that did not run from us. Rain fell unceasingly, one whole day, and no one wept. That night, the stars were gone. I slept on a bed of oak leaves beneath a ledge of stone, and with dawn, found a lizard curled beside me. Steam rose from bark and lichen. Acorns fell. I rose to seek the others, stepping softly. This is titled Highway 49. Cruising the twisty, two-lane highway surrounded on either side by bare-branched oak, ponderosa pine, and mighty redwoods driving through historic towns, Placerville, Ione, Fiddletown, El Dorado, I feel her spirit. One red-tailed hawk circles above against a breathtakingly blue sky, possibly the bluest sky I've ever seen. It glides, fueled by the air's current. I imagine her there, 10-year-old girl, thick dark hair pulled back in a messy, tangled ponytail, walking the forest gully, her rubber boots crackling on the jigsaw-like bark of the forest floor, wading ankle-deep in a shallow creek, balancing herself on the moss-covered river rocks, journal in hand. Friday morning moments to my dear friend, Lynn. As we walk, along with chat that sometimes veers to become sharing, you, who grew up on farmland, feed me, who grew up in cities. Botanical facts. 
How this weed anchors into the soil so fiercely you might never get rid of it. That wildflower proliferates if the slightest breeze whispers in its ear. This plant's purple blossom lasts only two weeks when it will wither, only to be reborn next year. You don't need to point out that some of the ugliest weeds release the sweetest smells. I remember some details, forget many. It is the nutmeg of your enthusiasm, being right here, right now, that feeds my soul. To speak to the trees. When you speak to the trees, you utter divine silence. There is neither ritual nor rote spirituality when you speak to the trees. When you speak to the trees, a fairy goddess or animated gnome may be standing by to lead you with a magic wand. When you speak to the trees, you engage in shared intention to prune the wilted and broken from healthy outstretched boughs. When you speak to the trees, there is no Best Buy expiration. You are doing free-form spring cleaning when you speak to the trees. For when you speak to the trees, you take cues from your heart. You weave a golden thread of connection when you speak to the trees. Spring night in Oakdale. It's a beautiful spring night, slightly chilly as the sun sits behind tall trees. Our poetry club meets at Bill Reinman's house. The assignment, write nature poetry. Conversation becomes a low murmur as heads bend over paper and pen. These are good friends who enjoy a turn of the word and sharing with others. Next door lives a former politician. The tall windows and red tile roof reflect the last rays of spring sun. The houses here are all new, except where we sit. This is the original farmhouse, built when fox and coyote ruled the river. Pushed out by humans, birds and animals abandon the area for quieter ground. Poets seek shelter within the old house as night comes. The Song of the Meadowlark, The Nest of the Killdeer. Begun in July of 2001 and finished in July of 2006. Spring can always be found in the Song of the Meadowlark. First there is a clear high single note. Then, even to one with an untrained ear, the notes seem to blend as they descend the scale. The metal lark sings a regional song with slight but significant differences. But the cry of the killdeer is the same everywhere. And when threatened killdeer feign injury become impaired, crippled birds dragging a broken wing in the dirt, dragging and crying. It's a throaty cry a gurgle of vulnerability that leads skunks or possums away from a nest hidden in short grasses. Built on the ground, the nest is exposed. It's only protection pretense, a mother's masquerade. Mothers everywhere watch the killdeer and marvel. At night, when they are sleeping, it is not the song of the metal ark that comforts them in their sleep but the nest of the killdeer, where they send the hearts of their children. Well, this is, this is a special day for many reasons. Uh, the first reason is to honor Lynn Hansen and her poem. The second reason is it's April 30th, right? It's Love Modesto Day, and right now some volunteers are cleaning up the Tuolumne River. And the third reason is I'm, I look out at so many poets, and this is probably one of the few times when per square foot there are more poets than there are people of the prose domain. No, no judgment, no judgment. People of the prose domain, sounds like a science fiction movie. but This is Unfinished Business from my book uh, Inkboat about 2014. 
The gadgets are whirring, they're whirring, and their whisper is like a low wind. Your eyelids are heavy, my children. You're tired, you're falling asleep. While the fish and the whales and the dolphins are swimming about in the deep. The boxes are flashing, they're flashing with pictures we cannot resist. You're under my spell, my devoted. Don't worry, you're going nowhere. While the hawks and the eagles and ravens are soaring aloft in the air. The screens are all shining, they're shining in a language we all understand. Give me your will, my servants. Obey what we shall command. While the wolves and the deer and the cougars are running all over the land. The rulers of earth are relaxing not plotting their feverish plans. Some earth for the moment is resting and healing as best as it can. Creatures are calling with primitive voices their masters cannot understand. All the birds of the sky and the fish in the sea and the beasts all over the land are restless, relentlessly staying alive and free and their fragile reprieve. Thank you. This poem is Nature's Study. It's just a simple leaf, transparent green at midday, gathering light from sunshine that comes through, reaches forth, lays itself deftly upon the woods. The leaf has a partner, a small sprig with tiny fingers, minuscule dried flowers and seed pods. Such simple elegance, such grace among the pines. And I too wish to stand with these unforced rhythms, so at home within themselves. I'd like to live where ravens speak in caws and clicks Watch from trees, strut proudly on the ground. Summer storms bring rolling thunder, jagged lightning across slate skies. Autumn chill paints trees in watercolor, shades of red and gold. Squirrels scamper across residential streets, scurry up tree trunks in backyards. Deer browse. Raccoons scavenge, coyotes smile, lope leisurely through fields of wildflowers. Snyder Road, Modesto. Am I on? <laughs> Thirty years ago, my street was sleepy, a narrow country road of many farms where I walked and watched become a busy collector of new streets, growing not peaches and walnuts and almonds, but monochromatic, huge, square homes planted there on our fine sandy loam, a soil so deep and rich it, equaled, it, it is equaled by only 1% of the Earth's crust. Trees, every crop, thrived in this magic soil, and now so do the homes, their sameness freed from watered-down color coats so as now their proud owners express themselves with fresh colors to make their homes bloom, assert their uniqueness, make us smile. This soil, I like to think, has done it all. Good morning. Um, I would like to dedicate this poem and this reading to Wendell Berry, first of all, because I stole the main idea from him. And then um, I would like to dedicate it to Lynn and Richard, who do so much to cultivate the culture of the museum and uh, Modesto. You see it every day, the three-legged turtle making his way through a world of dogs with snouts and teeth that can shear off a leg, and that is how he comes with his halting gait in search of fallen fruit and sun before he melts back into the sedges, edges off his hunger. 
It all turns. You see it every day. Thumb-sized dolphins, Anna's hummingbirds, drawing the nectar from aloe flutes, their musical bodies rising and falling, or bathing with abandon among mock orange blooms. It all turns, it all turns on affection, writes the wise poet, who will not subtract his labor from the landscape. So he plows with horses like his grandfather before him. Each one of us knows this, how it all turns on affection, on delight and amazement, rather than on love with its endless myth-making. It can turn on hatred, revenge, but not for long, because what lasts turns only on affection, on ecstasy at sunrise, on bruised petals and juicy tubes, on oak saplings and willow catkins, on acorn caps and bathing birds, on the screech owl waiting on the fence post, on orphaned ducks and goslings. It all turns, it all turns on embracing the mutilated world, grateful for however many legs we have, grateful for just one more day of breath, grateful for the fuse that drives the flower and the heat that dries it into seed. It all turns, it all turns on geopious affection, on compassion for our natal soil, even as dictators line us up, stand us over a ravine, aim a bullet at the back of our head and think they stop us dead, but here it comes. It all turns. It all returns and overturns the flawed ancestors, the arbiters of fortunes. But today, it comes to rest for a moment on the upturned faces of children listening to the story of the boy who caught a bee by its wings. Because he knew before he knew, and now they do too, how it all turns, how it all turns on affection. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, too, have one poem before I read the one that's on the plaque. And the reason I'm reading this poem is because, as you might guess, you learn from others. And one of the most important people that helped me learn about Vernal Pools was Margaret Flesher. And Margaret Flesher was also a a uh, foundation member of the Great Valley Museum. She and her husband, he was a photographer, and some of the photographs in the original museum behind the um, dioramas were his. And she spent hours teaching me about vernal pools. I'm the proud owner of some of her little uh, pen and ink drawings uh, of them, which I just cherish to this day. So this is a love poem to Margaret. Sea of grass, remembering Margaret. It was you who introduced me to the magic of Central Valley grasslands. Cool morning breezes, rippling waves of grass that swirl in a sea of solitude and roll up Mina Mound beaches of San Luis Island. It was you that piqued my interest in the large stands of native alkali sacaton and purple needle grass, the ones you detailed with pen and ink, capturing wonder into notebooks. 
And it was you who showed me the sand paths of bowls hidden beneath the petticoats of last year's bunch grass and the harrier gliding above, knowing that when its wings fold, the raptor would knife air, razor talons grasp furry morsel full of wriggle and limp. It was you who taught me to lie still in floral pools, blue with down India, listening to a choir of native bees buzzing their music until the sun sputtered goodbye on the horizon and the tawny coyote began to bark and yip. Then, like a tule boat of native people, you drifted away from the shoreline of your memory into the deep channel of silence where in this stillness, the grasses continue to whisper your name. I want to thank all of the poets. You realize that there are many groups are represented here. Uh, we have editorial people from the Song of the San Joaquin. We have people here from Stanislaus Connections that are responsible for presenting poetry every month that it is published. We have the afternoon poet representatives. We have the Sistina sisters. The three of us are here. Um, and we have uh, the most poetry center representatives and um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody but all of us, oh, the Michael uh, writing group, Michael is Modesto Institute of Continued Learning for Old People that still ha have ability to write their memories down. And they're all here. And isn't this wonderful to have such a, uh, an aggregation of uh, literary appreciation and literary skill. So let's give all of us a big applause for what we've done. <laughs> And since this is my unbirthday, uh, I wanted to say a little bit about this. Um, as many of you know, I retired 21 years ago from teaching biological sciences. Uh, it wasn't long after that, like two days, that I began volunteering in uh, San Joaquin County Office of Education and started writing curriculum about the uh, different ecosystems here. Anne Marie Bergen was one of the people that I was working with, and she's seated over here. And uh, we wrote some curriculum that now is still being used by children all over San Joaquin Valley uh, studying rivers. Then I began working with, I was a charter member of the Great Valley Museum and my son was three years old, I think he was, when they, they did a picture of him, Stan Elms did a picture of him pointing at a grizzly bear you know, from this uh, Osterberg collection to use as a stimulus to get fundraising to start the Great Valley Museum. And I'll never forget in that little video, in that little shoot, uh, he was standing, he was only Will, he was three, three and a half or so, and he was standing by this bear who was mounted, you've seen it, it and it's not right here right now, but you've seen it, and his eye was at the level of his testicles, the bear's testicles. <laughs> And he pointed to that and he said, he's a big one, isn't he, Mama? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next. So anyway, that's how the museum, uh, one of the promotional things to get people to uh, volunteer in and donate to the museum. So um, Meg Gonzalez and I were people that wrote a curriculum about vernal pools. And we've taken students from uh, Oakdale, from Salida, from uh, Waterford, from Turlock, from Stevenson boatloads, busloads of children out to study the vernal pools, which I'm really proud of. And we have a curriculum called Trekking the Tra Trail of the Tiger Salamander that, you know, uh, promotes education. And I think people love things when they know about them and until they are educated about them and experience them, it's hard to love something you don't know about. So I hope that we've shared the love with, with all these kids. Um, so uh, last year, my husband said, what would you like for your birthday? And I said, well, it's been 21 years and I've been working at this and not successfully, but I would like to have one of my poems on the Vernal Pool exhibit. Because when I retired, the colleagues and friends and relatives ponied up some money as a fundraiser to put together a, a diorama to create, commission a diorama to be formed of vernal pools. Because at the time at Great Valley Museum, there was not a diorama of vernal pools. So they collected about $15,000 and that was used to generate that tiny little exhibit right over there 
But remember, the museum at the time was small, so it fit nicely. Um, all of the things in that exhibit, in that diorama, are, are real. The real birds, real plants. They took the, the people at Oakland Museum of Natural History were the people that made this. And they took plants from the environment and freeze dried them and then hand painted them so that they're exactly like they would look. There's a lot of work that went into that, so the money was uh, well spent. So that was 21 years ago that that happened. And so last year for my birthday, which is in June, that's why I'm calling this my unbirthday, um, he, he said, well, I'd like to do that. So we got the plaque made and then pandemic was in full force, as you know. So things took a long time to happen, both with the foundry that made the plaque and then the school had to have a special reinforcement on the wall to hang it because it's heavy. And so we had one carpenter, I believe, in the whole place, right, Arnold? Yeah. And he was really busy for the whole district. So um, anyway, bottom line is about a month ago, it was finally ready to be uh, hung. And so uh, I, am, I am really excited. This is just uh, one of the most special birthday presents that you've ever given me, sweetie. Thank you. So... <laughs> so um, <laughs> and here's my poem, Lasenia Californica. Raindrops vibrate dry clay pan soil, collect into vernal pools scattered over Central Valley floor like small liquid mirrors. In these cauldrons of rebirth, spade foot toads stir from moist mud. Translucent cysts free fairy shrimp larvae. Tiger salamander nuptials begin long nocturnal trek. And summer seeds of goldfields, Lasthenia californica, awaken. O oh, Lasthenia of Matinea, female disciple of Plato, your golden namesake encircles vernal pools like floral lays cast at random into a sea of green rippling in soft breezes. Like you, these flowers live at the edge of their community. Without protection, they cluster in disguise, not as men, but as brilliant rings of vernal fire. Buzzing among them, a choir of native bees gathers glassy buckets of pollen for larvae nestled in earthen chambers, gifts from each tiny flower head before they scatter seed, lose everything. That's it. <laughs> I'm sort of like our friend in the Senate. I'm persistent. <laughs> okay, and so please join me in the other room for our unbirthday little buntinis and some coffee and water. And thank you so much for doing this. This has been just a really special day for me. And uh, I just love it that all the many different poetry and writing and reading and literary groups have assembled to celebrate um, words. Thank you. <laughs>